from Guy Ben Echelon, um, who is an Emerson alum, theater program, theater department, um, and he said, I have a wonderful opportunity for Emerson students to see Alan Zuckerman, and, um, and I think it would be a great fit for your class. So I teach a class on disability in the media, and my students are here, so thank you. Um, and um, so we are so thrilled to have Natalie here, but I'm going to let Ben um, come on up and give us a little background about Natalie and the events for today. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as as Nancy said, my name is Guy Ben Owen, and I'm an Emerson oh alum. I'm so sorry. That's all right. Uh, folks have said that I should rename the company That Guy Ben, so. <laughs> um, and I started this early stage while at Emerson. Uh, so uh, during my second year at Emerson, uh, through Amelia Vinasusan at the Theater Studies Program, uh, we started this company to share the diversity and vitality of Israeli culture in the hopes that by presenting uh, really strong points of view from Israel, we're able to talk about universal themes in an Israeli context, but when we talk about them, we actually get to talk about ourselves, uh, which is why uh, every single program is followed by a dialogue. So Natalie will be sharing her story with you for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. We'll turn the house lights back on so we can see your faces. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Natalie Zuckerman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, as the guy said, my name is Natalie Zuckerman, and uh, in 1990, when I was 12, I had an accident. Uh, it's not a car accident, it's rather a stupid accident, I think, anyway. Uh, an accident in the scouts. Uh, we went to a summer camp up in the north of Israel, and we built, in accordance with the annual issue that was the Israeli army, we built uh, a tank for big logs of wood. And this was where we all slept. Um, it was Saturday morning, and I was sent to the kitchen to work. Now, the kitchen was really far away, and I was a little child, and I was really afraid of people I don't know. Even today, I have to admit, I'm a bit timid of people I don't know. Um, so I lied. I said I had to bring something out of my bag. When I entered the tank, I heard, Natalie, watch out. And then the structure of the tank fell on me. Uh, I broke a vertebra in my back, I was paralyzed, I was hospitalized for about six months, and I had to learn to walk again. I walked with crutches until I was about 16. Even today it still affects me. I limp, I can't run, I can't jump, and I can't climb the stairs without any help.
Patrick Zuckerman. In 1990, when I was 12, I had an accident in the scouts and I broke a vertebrae in my back. At night, at the hospital, my mom asked Dr. Hanani, 1 meter 90 centimeter, 6 foot 2, if I would dance again. If she walks again, I will be pleased. I broke a vertebra, L1. L1 is located around here. It was broken completely and was thrown into the trash. And it was replaced with a bone taken from here, my left pelvis. The vertebra above it got twisted and it had to be put back in its place. The doctors tied the two vertebras together, the new and the old, and put two metal plates on both sides of my spine and left me with a scar. I had an x-ray a few years ago and I found out that one of my metal plates is broken. Hi. 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 My name is Nancy Zuckerman. Uh, in 1990, when I was 12, I had an accident in the scout and I broke a vertebra in my back. I was paralyzed. I was hospitalized for about six months. Um, I had to learn to walk again. And I walked with crutches until I was about 16. Even today, it still affects me. I limp, I can't run, I can't jump, and I can't climb the stairs without any help. Um, today, I'm actually 39, almost 40. And I graduated from Tel Aviv University, finishing my master's in performance. In one of the classes that I took there, I did a short piece, a short performance. And at the end of it, Nama, it's a good friend of mine, she gave me some feedback. She said, you always choose the liberty actions that emphasize your disability.
Thank you.
Um, but I don't know, faith or destiny always have kind of way of interfering, and, and that just became part of my life anyway, even in the, even in the hospital. In the bed next to me um, lied um, a woman called Tamar Boer. Boer is a very famous dancer and choreographer in the Israeli dancing. And when I was injured, she was in a car accident and she remained paralyzed and she's still until today was in a wheelchair. And when I heard she's in the hospital, I was, wow, I adored her, you know? I was like, she, she was the most amazing dancer, but I could see, I could see that she was struggling with her new situation. When she was released from the hospital, she continued to make work. And she made work until today. She's quite a famous choreographer. And, and also she danced in her own pieces. Um, and when I was released from the hospital a few years later, I met my old dance teacher. And she told me that she went to see Tamar Boel. So I was very excited because I couldn't even imagine how a woman in a wheelchair can dance. That looked to me completely mad. And I asked her, how was it? And she said to me, um, Tamar should leave the dancing for the dancers. What she does, in my eyes, doesn't consider to be dancing. And that, that really stayed with me for a very, very long time. And you know what? I agreed with her. I believed her. You know, the, the, the dance, the stage is for those that can, and I couldn't, so that was that. But I really missed the stage. And I wanted, today I can say that I was looking for a way to heal. And uh, I asked my mom to enroll me to a drama class. So I was about 14, uh, but in order to get in, I had to do an audition. And it was the most amazing day. Uh, it was this auditorium, and at the time I worked with crutches. And I got to the stage, and it was just me and the teacher in the, in the auditorium. And I went on stage with my crutches and put them down. And then I sat on the chair, like today, because I find it difficult to stand for a very long time. Um, and then all of a sudden, all the lights went black, were blacked out completely, and there was only one light. And that light was on me. And I started my monologue, and I knew that she was watching me, and it was magic. And it was the very first time that I enjoyed someone watching me. Because I want to remind you, I was about 14 and was walking with my crutches. And all the time, people kept staring at me, like all the time. And it was, it, it was a daunting experience because I had um, doctors examining me on a weekly basis, physiotherapists touch me on a daily basis. I had private investigators following me on behalf of the Social Security Office or on behalf of the um, insurance companies. So I had to literally have to close the windows or like to close the curtains all the time. So God forbid they will see me do something that might look like in a picture that you know that I'm not that I've got that doesn't have a disability. Um, people at school, people in the streets, the kids at school pointing at me, gossiping at me. So that was a horrible experience for me. You know, I just felt I'm performing like every day. But on stage, I can control the gaze. I can control what you see of me and how you see of me. But you know, in real life, we can't control it. So what happened was that as a teenager, who, you know, we don't want people to look at us when we're teenagers. So I was completely with my head down, like that. And this painter said, you know, if I don't see you, you don't see me. If I don't look at you, you don't look at me. That was kind of, you know, the math that I had in my head at the time. But I wanted to think, not just about me, you know, the disabled person performs on a daily basis. If we'll take a, a person in the wheelchair boarding a bus, so I don't know how it works here, but in Israel, you have to stop the bus, the driver has to stop the bus, leave, the sp you know, leave his chair, go to the back, get a little ramp, put it like a stage, and then the person in the wheelchair has to go on the bus, and everyone looks at him, you know, like an audience looking at an actor. So if you had to go through that every day, and that's in a way what I had to go through that every day at that time, that was horrible. And I, you know, I didn't want that. But the stage became my refuge. The stage became a place that I can control everything. 
When I was 16, the, doc the doctors told me that I don't need my crutches anymore if I don't want to. And I put them aside. Because I didn't want anyone to look at me down the streets. I didn't want anyone to think that I've got a disability. So I just decided I want to pass as someone that doesn't have a disability, and it was amazing. You know, that feeling that I can walk down the street and people stop looking at me, that was like, wow. And I loved it. Um, of course, people, for example, at school knew about it, and they were also very, very supportive. I had a, a, a special car drive taking me every day to school. Um, due to really horrible back pains I had at the time. I was, um, you know, it was all approved in advance by my teacher when I didn't go to school. Uh, I was exempt from sports lessons because I couldn't run or do very physical activities. Um, I was also exempt from high school trips because that also involves hiking and a lot of walking and that was really difficult for me. I didn't want to sit in the bus. Um, so at the time, it felt amazing, you know. I said to the teachers, I can't take part. And everyone was like, yes, of course, you don't have to take part, that's fine. Um, but in retrospect, it actually meant that I didn't do almost any activities at school, except to study. Now in Israel, there's a lot of uh, social activities when you're students, and I didn't take part in any of them. I was completely excluded. And I'm a teacher today. And I can't help it by wondering, wasn't it just the easiest way out for everyone? Why no one fight over me? Why no one said, you know, we should change the curriculum in sports, for example. You know, maybe I can't run, but I'm really good at Pilates or yoga. You know, so they could have changed the curriculum in order for me to take part. Or even high school trips. Okay, so for this trip, no one would go hiking, but everyone would go to a museum. So they could have changed things in order for me to take part. But, you know, I didn't say anything. I just said, I can't do it. And they were like, yes, yes, that's fine, that's fine. You don't need to take part. And that's the way it worked for about three years in high school. I was staying at home most of the time, and that was all agreed. So those are kind of the teenage years of my life. Um, at the age of 18, and it's ready to go to the army. Everyone goes to the army, girls and boys. Um, but again, I was excluded and was told I won't be able to be drafted. Again, fine, I don't want to be in the army, I want to be an actress, <laughs> you know. So I was like, okay, I'll start phoning um, acting schools and trying to get auditions. Um, the first acting, acting school I phoned, uh, I was asked why I didn't go to the army. So I told them, hi, my name is Lachie Zuckerman in 1990 when I was 12, the whole story. Um, and then was asked if I'll be able to take movement classes. And I said, I don't think I will. Maybe, I don't know. But we are really, really sorry, but we won't even be able to let you audition. So those were the kind of reaction I got. I did actually get into one of the acting schools, to the preparatory program. You know, not first year, but let's see how it works. Um, you know, and I'm not naive. My Ophelia will always win. And I know the perception, you know, the perception is an actor needs to be versatile, needs to be uh, a chameleon. They need to be able to embody different characters, different characteristics, and that, you know, I get it. And at the same time, we also have what's called typecast. So how many limping characters do we know? I know about three. Two of them are males, it's Oedipus and Richard III. Again, can't do those. So, not really. And also on the Israeli stage, never saw any disabled actors, or in the dance scene, or in the cinema. And that was, I know, that was 20 years ago, but even today, you know, hearing characters played by, uh, sorry, deaf characters played by hearing actors, and different disabilities the same. And even I read in the newspapers, I think it was about a year ago, um, they interviewed this um, gorgeous, uh, disabled, emerging actress, that, that would be my kind of definition of her, and um, she talked about her ordeal to get into the acting schools, and that was about five years ago when she tried to get in. And she was refused. She actually went to an audition, but she was refused to all of them. So she decided to, to have an experiment. In the last edition, 
She lied. She's, she's got a limp, so she decided she will say that she twisted her ankle. And guess what? She got in. Two weeks later, when they realized her um, twisting ankle isn't going away, it's not disappearing, um, she was called to the office of the head of the school. And she was told she was on probation, not because she lied. She was on probation because they weren't sure there is enough space for people with disabilities in the Israeli theater scene, so they'll have to see. She didn't graduate, and she is in films and on stage, so that's good. Um, but the message was at the time that, you know, you're actually quite good, but maybe, you know, maybe be a director, you know, behind the scenes, you'll be amazing. And, you know, I was like, great, I want to be amazing, so I decided to go and study directing. And I went to study directing in Seminar Kibbutzim College. Um, and again, you, as a director, you have to study. You have to study movement classes, you have to take acting classes. And in movement classes, I didn't take part. And you know what? I didn't want to take part. Because it's really hard to see all my friends actually doing things. And, you know, it was, a, it was too much painful. And I didn't want to take part in it. Um, and again, no one said, you have to. So that was fine. But something changed in my last year. Um, we were asked to make uh, a theatrical event in which we introduce ourselves to, to our classmates. Now, I was like, well, we've been together for three years. Like, what do they not know about me? Uh, and I decided that instead of choosing a character, I will be myself on stage for the very first time. And I will do certain actions that they never, seen, saw, me, that they never saw me do before. Um, so I danced. After 10 years that I didn't dance, I danced on stage. And I invited people from the audience to come and dance with me. In another segment of the show, I exposed my back, and I asked people to color paint my scar. And while that's happening, I noticed that people were very much with me, and that it was interesting for them. I could even hear some people crying in the audience. And it was the very first time that I thought to myself, wow, I miss that. I miss being on stage. And maybe, maybe I've got a story that it's worth telling. But I knew. I knew that was one exercise in three years. You know, what are the chances I'll be able to do those kind of stuff in the Israeli theater scene? That doesn't make any sense. So I decided I want to go and study abroad, and I decided to go and study in Scotland. Uh, both of my parents also study abroad. My dad in UCLA, my mom in London. So, you know, I wanted to do that also. And because I was really sheltered as a child, because of my injury, I wanted to kind of find my own independence. So I decided to go and study design, um, device theater and perform performance art or live art because I felt that that's maybe the only place that I will be able to make my own roles. Um, and it was all based on group work and collaborative process. Okay, first day, first class, we had to play tag. Now, I can't run. So, you know, like I do every time, on every first occasion, I went to, to my professor and said, hi, my name is Satsi Zuckman, in 1990 when I was 12, I had an accident in the scouts, again. Now, I want you to think about it, that I've been doing it since I was 12. So almost once a week or twice a week, I have to tell the, the, same, the same story. You can, you know, count in your head how many times I've said it already. Um, and how much anxiety it produces because I don't want people to know that I've got a disability. I don't like it. Because every time I have to say it on every first occasion, it means that I'm singled out. It means that I'm the one who's got a problem and is going to sit aside now. And I hate it. I just hate it that it's about me. So I went to him and again, told him the whole of the story, and I'm used to this look of most people go like that. Wow. <laughs> you know, and I feel like they're saying, so sorry, we're so sorry. And then I go, and then, and then they say, you know, that's fine, see the side. Like I said, that's what I'm used to. But what happened was that he just kept asking me a bunch, bunch of questions about my injury, about my disability, and then he said, um, um, you know, you have to take part. Everyone here takes part. Really? It's like, well, what does it mean? We have to change the rules of the game. 
the game won't define who we are, we will define the game. At the time I didn't really understand what it means, but now I know that it means that everyone can play the game. We don't have those who can be able and those who can the disable, but everyone can play the game. We just have to be very creative in finding new rules for the game. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I, I start asking myself, what does it mean? Does that mean that until this moment I didn't take part? There was a game and I didn't take part in it? I was excluded for so many games? You know, life is a game. What does it mean about me? So from that, from that day, I started taking movement classes. Um, the movement tutors, the movement professors were from the acting department, which, and I studied performance, so, you know, they had that image of how an actor should be. Um, and it wasn't easy for them, but they, but they tried. And we worked really hard, both me and them, to, you know, to accommodate my needs and to find the right exercises. But also what was interesting for me is that, you know, they had this idea of how an exercise should look like when you do it. And all of a sudden when I did it, it looked completely different. So they had to start finding beauty in it. And I realized that it's actually quite beautiful when I do things different. You know, you know some of you study in theater, so, you know, conflict. People failing. That's actually quite interesting to watch. That's what drama is based on. So my movement, if we look at it as failure, it's actually a new aesthetic of failure. <laughs> or even more that, we can say that it's not disability, it's just a different ability to do things. So when my leg shiver, or when I can't get, un get dressed, that's actually quite beautiful. There is an aesthetic about it. And when I shiver, no one shiver like me. Meryl Streep can't shiver like me. <laughs> I've got the best shiver. It's beautiful. So it meant that everyone has to start looking at things differently. And for me, it meant that I need to start shedding this desire to be so much behind the scenes, or the desire to stay in the disability closet, and to start kind of moving forward. Around this time, I realized also that I never ever associated the word disabled with my situation. Now I say it a lot, but I was the girl with the limp. That was that. And you know what? I never had any disabled friends. Remember I told you that I uh, had a, a special car drive taking me to school? So the other kids in that special car drive were also disabled. <coughs> Study with me the same school? You know what? I don't know even their names until today. I excluded myself from that. And I had, a, I had a, a diary that I wrote in hospital, and I referred to myself in the diary as being almost disabled. Because next to me, in one of the beds, was Liat. She was around my age, and she was in a wheelchair. So she was the miserable one who was going to stay like that, and I was the one that get out of it. And also, you know, the patient in the, in the hospital, they excluded me from that position because, you know, they saw that everyone is, you know, helping me to start walking again and my rehabilitation got a lot of people helping me. So, you know, I was the one that managed to, to leave. They stayed in wheelchair, I can walk. So that was the kind of atmosphere I grew up, also with my family. We never talked about myself as having a disability. And that was... That was really interesting to me at that time, and I was like, why is that? Why, why, do you, why, why am I so afraid of it? And when I moved back to Israel, and I referred to myself, you know, I've got a disability, my friends used to shout at me, you're not disabled. And I had that a lot, or different, you know, all the signs that I've been holding, you know, all those texts that I used to hear all of a sudden. You don't, you're not disabled. I have to say I was a bit flattered when people say that. I'm still a bit flattered when people say that because that means, you know, that's not a big deal, that's like nothing. But at the same time, it's like, why are we so scared of it? Why am I so scared of it? And I decided to go and do a little research. Um, and I found this book. And in this book, they were talking about how the world is divided into two groups of people. Those who are disabled now and those who will be disabled in the future. <laughs> Which means, ladies and gentlemen, that we are all on the disability spectrum. 
And that's why we're so scared of it. Because when we see a person with disability, we know deep down that we can be in their shoes. And we will be, because you know, a few years by now, a hip replacement, most of us. Maybe a caretaker, being in a nursing home, having horrible back pains, not being able to walk up the stairs so easily. You know, we're all on the disability spectrum, and that's why our fear of, the dis of that word of disabled people is so unsettling and so deep. Um, I wanted to, be, to stop being so scared. And, um, and I was wondering, why am I saying I'm disabled? Where is it coming from? And I realized that at home, for example, I don't feel disabled at all. Because everything is accommodated to my needs. And I don't feel there is, there's a problem. But the minute I leave my flat, the minute I go outside, my disability arises its head. Um, my biggest enemy is the staircase. Any staircase. Because um, when I have to go up the stairs, I have to uh, use the railing, and it's very difficult for me. I have to really concentrate to be able to actually do that specific action. Uh, and I don't know if it's for you, but most people, you know, they just go up and down, they don't really think about it. So when I realized that, I realized that, you know, the staircase is, is a barrier fence between those who can and those who can't. You know, my, I hate that moment when you go to a staircase and there's a sign saying on a, a fresh paint. And I'm like, what am I going to do now? And then I have to go like a, like a little child when they take, you know, one step, two steps at a time. And then everyone, obviously, looking at me. Why is she walking like that? Well, that's, that's what I'm imagining in my head. Why is, she look, why is she walking like that, like a two-year-old? So if the whole of you know, Boston, for example, will be like a spiral, like I went to the um, aquarium. In the aquarium, everything is built like a spiral. So everyone can walk up together. Um, people with trolleys, people in a wheelchair, me. But the minute you go to the stairs, you'll see their signs. You know, people with strollies and people with wheelchair needs to go to the lift. The lift is just take right, 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 and at the end. So if we'll all go together, if we'll all go in a spiral, then there won't be a division, at least in that specific case. So I wanted to observe that, and I wanted to look at it and make a performance about it. And um, I decided to um, find a really busy staircase. And trust me, in every place where I study, in Tel Aviv University or wherever I go, there is a quite a um, hard staircase looking at me. Um, and I decided to put my beautiful black dress. So again, I won't look disabled at all. And I wanted to walk up the stairs, but to walk it like an able person does. So that means that instead of doing it for five minutes, it took me about three hours, like a traditional piece, because I had to do it correctly. And every time I messed it up and I didn't manage to do it, I had to do this step again. And I was invited to do it in a Jerusalem Cinematic, which has got a huge staircase in the middle of it. And it was part of the Disability Art Festival. Um, so I found myself standing in the middle of the staircase, um, blood in my hair, looked very beautiful, uh, walking up and down with everyone else, and obviously everyone else walking really fast, and I'm the only one that walks really slowly. So I became the element that interferes in the flow of the crowd. And um, people sometimes shouted at me, that's, you're in the way, you're in the way, get away. And I just want to remind you that we're in a disability art festival. Um, some people came to me and say, wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be easier to take the lift? Um, others suggested um, if I need any help, or other people just looked at me like a wheel. But at the corner of the eye, of my eye, I saw this guy. And he was holding, he was walking with his crutches. Uh, and he was there for about three hours with me. And after the show, he came to me and he introduced himself and he said he's got uh, several palsy. And he said, this is my life. This is my everyday life. That's what happened to me. I want to take the stairs, but no one, you know, everyone has something to say. 
And everyone's like, he said that people are actually trying to help him go to the lift. And he's like, I don't want to take the lift. I want to go up the stairs. I don't care that I'm, you know, in your way. Wait. It was the very first time that the person that we will all agree that has got a disability said that we are alike. Said that we share the same experience, the same feeling. And I realized that I have a community. I have people that know what some going through. I really thought that was just my own stories. And I realized it was time, it was time to stop hiding and it was time to claim my rights. And around that time I was 74. And I decided to do my show. I decided to do the other body. And that's why it's, it's, it's starting with the, this moment of me standing in the middle of the stage and holding a sign over my head saying that I'm disabled. You know, this is not an overcoming story. And this is still a journey that I'm going through. That conflict of being disabled, not being disabled, being happy about it, not being happy about it. Looking, enjoying seeing myself on stage, not enjoying seeing myself walking. But I know one thing that I learned is that there aren't enough disabled people in the media and in center stage or other bodies in general, whatever you decide another body is. And it's time that we won't go away. It's time that we'll have representation on stage because we're, you know, because we're here and we're here to stay. Thank you very much for listening to today and being part of my uh,